Um, Sammy, I'm going to start with you. Uh, so as a physiotherapist, if I see an elbow injury, how do I know what I can look after myself and what, what are the triggers that, that, that would say to me I need to send this for immediate review? Uh, is this working? All oh, good. Um, it, it all comes down to the clinical examinations at about a week later. And if you're confident in your clinical skills and you're happy to palpate all the bony areas and that your clinical assessment gives you a diagnosis of what's going on and that you can manage that, then manage that. If you're worried at all, um, then we should see them. They don't need high level imaging or necessarily repeat x-rays, but it's very much a clinical assessment. Um, one of the problems with elbow injuries are missed injuries, you know, missed lateral condyles, missed epicondylas that are displaced, um, or when there's problems down the track. Over immobilisation can lead to prolonged stiffness, even in children. So uh, elbows are one of the, the grey zones that I'm always happy to see and assess and make a definite plan and know exactly what's going on because there's not, uh, there's sometimes more risk than necessarily you'd want to take on. So it all depends on your comfort level. All right, thank you. Um, uh, staying with you just for a moment, and uh, Chris may want to comment on it. Um, a physiotherapist, uh, they diagnose a six-year-old with a clavicle fracture. Can they treat that themselves? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> sling for two weeks, that's it. Um, reassure the parents, no further x-rays, please. Um, I see a number of patients who've had multiple x-rays just to make sure it unites. Under four-year-olds always unite. Um, the thyroid gland is right there, and it's all about minimising unnecessary radiation. Uh, they will do absolutely fine. Okay, fantastic. Um, Chris, um, there's a couple of comments that the return to sport protocols aren't in your notes, but we'll certainly post them on the uh, Orthosports website uh, under the education section. Under, so if you go to knee, then ACL, then ACL rehab, there is already a copy of the uh, FIFA 11 plus for adults there, plus the knee 333, which is the netball program. Uh, and it's all free, like there's a few uh, websites offering you to pay for these things, but don't, just go to the Orthosports website because they're all there for free as rehab protocols. Uh, and we'll post that, the, the kids one there as well. So uh, FIFA, um, as you all know, is a money-making organisation. This is the first thing that they have ever given away for free. So it's quite incredible. But, and and it's, it's, there's a massive, massive change in, in the uh, re-injury rate post-surgery as well as, as a prehab thing. Um, and uh, so, Chris, what about the return to sport for these kids? Do you know of evidence that shows that if they wait longer before they go back to sport, they are less likely to re-injure themselves? Like, so you have the 13-year-old, 14-year-old, you do your ACL reconstruction. First, tell us how you choose your graft, and then tell us when can they go back to sport without an unacceptable risk. And, and just t talk to the webinar people as well. So in terms of graft choice, for children, my preference is always their own hamstrings graft. Uh, there was a big push a number of years ago for living donor grafts for children. So that means the dad goes into the theatre next door to them, you harvest the dad's hamstrings and use that for the graft. And that had very good results when done by the group at the MARTA. Uh, but it's very, very costly, very time consuming and requires two theatres with two surgical teams. Uh, I, the only time I wouldn't use a child's own hamstrings is if it was a revision procedure or if they were ligamentously lax. Uh, in Australia, we've now got access to uh, fresh frozen allograft, which has been shown to be basically equivalent to your own hamstrings for ACL reconstruction in terms of re-rupture rate. In terms of return to sport, I tell all children minimum one year off sport. We know if they go back before then, their re-injury rate is higher. The re-injury rate drops all the way out to two years after an ACL reconstruction for children. But keeping children off sport for two years is nearly impossible. I think anyone who's got a teenager or knows any teenagers knows that they will not be off sport for two years. So my, we'll post the uh, protocol on the website, but for adolescents, you want them to be 90% of the contralateral side in terms of limb strength testing and bulk. Uh, and for children under 14 that can't do the dynamometer testing, 
I use the triple hop test as my baseline level for them. So once their triple hop test is 90% of the contralateral side and done in a controlled manner, and it's been a year, I'm happy for them to get back. Okay. All right, very good. Um, Andreas, can the patients tell if they've got a dual mobility hip versus a regular hip? No, uh, most patients can't tell the difference. There are just occasionally patients who are aware of that click as the neck of the femoral prosthesis hits the plastic and they get used to it just like patients with total knees get used to their knees clicking. It's not a problem, but otherwise they, they feel exactly the same. And then the follow-up question for that is, is why wouldn't we just do this in every single patient? Uh, at present, we are short of data. If we're going to do evidence-based surgery, we're not yet sure that they last as long as some of the other, such as ceramic on ceramic articulations, which we've had. Now in France, they use many more of them. The problem in France, they haven't got the same registry. So we sometimes think that some of the information is more anecdotal whilst in our case, we are still lagging behind, and you saw that on the curves, that the dual mobility has only been really available probably for eight years. Uh, the registry only records the um, information of more than 500 having been done of any particular sort. So time will tell, and maybe we will we use them in, in younger patients as well. All right. Um Thanks, Andreas. Sammy, those ankle injuries that you're talking about rehab, do ankle injuries lead to more knee injuries? Uh, and Chris, you could answer this as well. If someone's had an ankle injury and they don't rehab properly, are, properly, are they more likely to injure their ACL? Look, I have seen it in patients where they have chronic ankle instability and then that leads to a knee injury. I don't think there's any evidence for it but that would just be anecdotal. So it's, it's again got to do with placement and activity levels and whether or not they've rehabbed properly and got the balance, but it's just anecdotal. Agreed. Okay. Um, how dangerous are trampolines for kids in terms of <laughs> ACL injuries or paediatric injuries generally? Uh, full disclosure, I had an adult trampoline for my child growing up and all the neighbourhood kids used it. We had no fractures for about 10 years. So, um, look, uh, some of the trampolining places around are high-level trampolines where they do crazy things. Um, and uh, some of the new trampolines where you actually put the safety net around them just actually creates a third wall for them to jump off is the reality. Um, the... The best child is a kid that's out there, active, challenging things, learning balance, learning how to push themselves. So I, I, I think we should actually be encouraging our children to be active and getting out there rather than uh, worrying about this. But it needs to be supervised in many ways. That's all I can say about trampolines. They're great fun. I love them. So. <laughs> Just on a personal note, I used to take my kids to Time Zone, which is uh, closed down, and on three separate occasions, I had to treat dislocations of different body parts. Uh, just you know, watching my kids uh, doing things and then fall, you know, finding somebody else fall in a screaming heap. It was always the adults that got injured. It was never the kids that got injured. You know, dislocated shoulder, dislocated uh, patella and an ankle fracture, all in significantly overweight adults who hadn't been exercising and all of a sudden decided to go and jump on their trampolines. So by the end, the actual, the, the people that worked there knew who I was. I didn't have to show them that I was a doctor each time I went there. Anyway, um, Chris, um, so you, you get the EOS scans uh, in the kids beforehand. Um, what do you specifically do in, in the cases where you go um, not through the physis, it's fine, but when you do go transficeal, do you have a specific protocol of how you monitor these patients postoperatively? And, and if you do find something's going wrong, what do you do? Absolutely. So for anyone who are going transficeal with open growth plates, they get an EOS scan beforehand to look at their lateral distal femoral angle and their overall limb alignment. So we've got something to compare it to after the surgery. I'll then get an EOS scan at six months, 12 months, and then yearly until their growth plates have closed afterwards. 
if there's any sign on those EOS scans that we've altered the growth of their distal femur, so if they're developing progressive valgus in particular, which is what we're looking for, I would uh, have a, a low threshold to go and ablate their growth plate. So it's a, you do a small procedure called an epiphysiodesis, a one centimetre cut on either side of the knee, and you drill out the growth plate and stop it from growing. Because a limb that is straight is much easier to treat straight and short is much easier than a limb that's angled. So I would do my best to not damage the growth plate, but if it does happen, I would stop the growth plate growing completely. Your lateral, dis your lateral femoral growth plate contributes nine millimetres of growth per year, so if you're close to skeletal maturity and you're ablated, it's not the end of the world. If they're going to end up with a deformity of more than two or three centimetres, then you have a discussion with the child and with the family. We can either stop the other side as well so they stay equal, or if it's going to be a significant growth difference, we can lengthen their femur at a later date. But, but the reality is we're talking about an incredibly small number of cases. Exactly. That, that this this is, it's case. very unusual. This is like theoretical rather than yeah. what we see on the day-to-day -day exactly. basis. So I haven't had to do that. All right, Andreas, uh, coming back to you, um, two, two linked questions. Number one, does it matter whether you go anterior or posterior in terms of a dual mobility hip? And, and the second part of the question is, what do you do if this dual mobility dislocates? Because I assume you can't do an easy closed reduction like you would have been able to do with a, a standard hip. These are almost uh, surgeon-type questions. Um, <clears throat> It, the a dual mobility can put in anterior or posterior, just like we put on all other heads. In fact, the prosthesis which we put in from anterior or posterior are the same. And so that makes no difference. You noticed on one of the slides that the dislocation rate for all uh, articulations is uh, half a percent lower for the anterior approach, so they still get dislocations, it's just a little lower. The dislocation, once it happens, can be more tricky as the corner of the outer or plastic head gets caught on the edge of the prosthesis, but most of them can still be done closed. Where it gets very difficult is a rare case where there's a dislocation and the two heads come apart, which is a dissociation, and then, of course, you have to operate and put them back together. Thanks, Andreas. Um, Samia, the 15-year-old uh, kid uh, who's playing rugby for the school and the club, he's got a clavicle fracture. The clavicle fracture's at 45 degrees, even though the bones are touching, and we know it's going to heal. Once it heals at 45 degrees with that slightly shortened shoulder girdle, if he impacts again on that crooked fracture, is that more likely than a regular clavicle to break, or is it the same likelihood? I mean... It is slightly higher risk with the presence of a malunion. The shortening and the functional implications has not been proven in the adolescent population. Yep. And that's one of, one of the concerns that people talk about is relative scapular thoracic shortening on one side. Now that has to be significant. And it's because there is still remodelling. The clavicular growth plates are open until your early 20s and there can actually be that remodelling potential. Whether you look at the nature of the sport and the incidence of injury, what he's doing is giving him the highest risk anyway of having fractures, is, is the reality. Yeah. <laughs> and Correct. it's probably better to fracture your clavicle than to dislocate your shoulder anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> Correct, because it will heal and they'll do well. And we all know shoulder dislocations in young people are, are problematic. Yeah. Well, we'll hear more about that later, actually. Um, all right, so... Um, Chris, uh, you spoke uh, about the um, female PA, um, uh, athletes starting to have more and more ACL injuries. So we know there are certainly genetic differences, you know, valgus alignment, narrow a notch. Uh, but I guess part of it is also that the males have been training younger sidestepping sports for so much longer. So they've kind of self-selected to some extent. They've already stopped playing. Whereas the females these days with the more professional sports are often starting later and we're only finding out who these people are later. Do you think uh, training on synthetic pitches and use of things like different types of studs is more problematic in the female than the male population? Or is it just problematic in everybody? Should we all be playing on grass? Like, what, what are your thoughts on, on multiple factors there? 
So it's very, very multifactorial. Uh, I think your point about the female athletes uh, kind of doing more in their late teens, early 20s, while that's probably a phenomenon now, we do see lots and lots of young girls competing in representative teams as young as 10 in netball and in other sports. And they're getting pushed really hard by coaches to do more than their bodies are ready for. And I think that, you know, the, the rate of... Uh, injuries in the under 14 group is in girls is going up by 8.8% per year, hmm. year on year. So I think that's a lot of the early rep development squads. In terms of the synthetic pitches, I think you do see more injuries. Again, it's all anecdotal. The reason no one in Australia knows what a turf toe is is because all of our rugby is played on grass pitches and soccer is played on grass pitches, whereas in the US, where their NFL is played on synthetic pitches, turf toe is a huge problem. So... You know, I think with all injuries, there's just less give uh, in the synthetic. Yeah, look, I mean, even in the eastern suburbs, like Ulara, they've gone to all synthetic there because there were, the games were going to yeah. get rained out so often that, that we are seeing more and more synthetic pitches being set up with baseball, with soccer, yeah. uh, and uh, less so with rugby because tackling on a turf uh, thing, you get big grass burns. <laughs> but, but certainly with soccer, we're seeing it more and more. Samuel? Can I ask Chris a question? At our recent paediatric meeting, um, there was a very interesting presentation looking at some of the Australian registry, and there seems to be an uh, unusual peak in ACL injuries, which is increasing in the under 10-year-olds. What, what can we do in that regards? What do you think? It's a very difficult uh, age group because they all want to be playing high-level sports, You've probably seen that the NRL has come out and said that they don't want any representative teams under the age of 13 being played or any children being streamed into high-performance squads under the age of 13, which is very, very sensible and is actually very good player management from the NRL. And that probably needs to be extended across all sports to reduce the number of high-level training and rep squads from netball, basketball, cricket, everything to reduce the number of injuries because 10 year olds just aren't built to train five times a week they're going to get injured yeah. Yeah. Uh, in on that uh, note i'd also like to give our orthopedic association another little plug because chris vertulo in uh, queensland has actually started the youth injury prevention program which is particularly aimed at acl to train uh mainly jumping uh type exercises uh, to improve proprioception awareness and actually strength in these kids. And you'll see more about that. And I think it very much going to involve those of you who are involved in sports teams that, that, uh, that we have to be careful with what we promote because we promote sport in general health, but we have the downside. and We can be a bit more uh, selective there what we allow these kids to do. And it, certainly in America with the baseball pitching, you know, the kids are limited to, you know, 500 pitches total per season. And if they go over that, they're automatically taken out of the program, etc. cetera. Um, Chris, um, there's a few questions here about rehab protocols. Uh, you know, do you prefer the knee 333? Do you prefer the PEP, um, uh, PEP program? Do you prefer the FIFA 11 plus? And I guess for kids, there's a specific one there, but for adults, uh, it probably doesn't really make that much difference what they do as long yeah. as they're doing one of them, right? Absolutely, as long as they're doing something. Yeah. As long as they're following a structured protocol that's being supervised by the physiotherapist who's testing them and making sure that they're doing everything properly, yeah. I don't mind which protocol they use for... Personally, I don't like the PEP as much because it's got a lot more stretching in it, and I don't think the stretching is particularly good for their proprioceptive retraining. That's why I shifted away from the PEP yeah. when the FIFA 11 Plus first came out yeah. um, to, to that one. Uh, and also, I just really like the fact that FIFA gave away something for free. <laughs> um, uh, Andreas, um, so what does no hip... Uh, protocol uh, precautions actually mean you know so the patient has their operation they get up the next day can they basically just ignore that hip for those of you who've been around for a bit longer we used to have the so-called Charlie pillow the Charlie pillow was a, um, a monstrous uh, device between the legs which made people sleep on their back to keep the legs spread uh, it wasn't very popular, and, and yet we grew up with it. 
as if it was an essential part of the operation. Uh, now you can't actually find a Charlie pillow in the hospital, which is a good thing. And so, number one, no Charlie pillow. Number two, get up straight away. Yes, you can sit. Uh, look, we don't want extreme movements early on because, like in other areas of surgery, we actually want the capsule uh, and the, uh, the wound to heal. So it's best to wait a little bit and to let that happen. How long does that take? It usually takes a month or so. And then, really, people do more and more. Uh, do they always get the same range of motion as the other side? The answer is no, because they didn't have it actually before the operation. And so a lot of the soft tissues around that hip joint are tight, but they almost all have a much, much better and moreover a painless range of motion compared to before. So right now there's, uh, the, the, I ask them not to do extreme movements, but they can sit in a low chair and they don't need a raised toilet seat and uh, most people just have normal activities. Fantastic. Look, the last question here, um, there were actually multiple versions of the same question. Who here has heard Tom Cross's uh, non-operative uh, treatment uh, of uh, ACL injuries uh, lecture recently? Any of you? Well, uh, just for, for those that don't know, Tom Cross is a sports med physician. Most of you, I think, probably will have heard of Merv Cross if you were around long enough. Merv was sort of one of the pioneers of ACL surgery, and his son is a sports medicine physician. He's actually now promoting non-operative treatment of uh, ACL. So the, you know, Merv, Merv replaced them all, and now that his career is finished, Tom's going the other way. Um, but but uh, the, the things to understand, I, I know Tom, I like Tom, I've listened to his lecture. It, all the stuff that he's doing is not peer reviewed. It's a single location study with no scientific backup yet. Uh, so anybody that wants to come and talk to me about the non-operative protocols for ACL, I'm very happy to have a chat to you in the break if you'd like to. Um, and we're not going to really discuss anything more about it other than to say Merv's a great guy, Tom's a great guy, but there's no peer review of what he's um, pushing uh, at the moment. All right, I'll thank the panel. If you, when you go outside, please, if you have any rubbish, take it with you. We'll have a morning tea break for half an hour and then we'll reconvene. Thanks very much. Thank you.